Marjon Beauchamp has become a fan favorite for Bucks fans. And I think, first of all, because there hasn't been too much, too many rookies on this team. But secondly, he has an intriguing skill set that in a perfect world could benefit the Bucks. So I'll go on to the expert. We've got Sam Fasini here from The Athletic. And once we get through Marjon Beauchamp, I also want to ask the question about the value of draft picks because we went through a fascinating trade deadline. Let's get into it. You are locked on Bucks. Your daily Milwaukee Bucks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Bucks. My name's Kane Pittman. You can see and hear me on the show Monday to Friday and also find my work over at ESPN. And alongside me, a fellow Melbourneian from The Athletic, a man that does just an, a, a, an amount of work that I can't quite wrap my head around. <laughs> and this is typically what happens to these draft maniacs that know every single detail. Sam Vecini, I couldn't have thought of a better intro than that. Yeah, maniac. I, I think that's the main <laughs> word that I took away was maniac. I think that's <laughs> definitely the way to put it. No, I'm super glad. This is great. Um, we just did my show, which was fantastic. I'm so glad that we got a chance to talk about NBA title tiers. We got a chance to talk about the Milwaukee Bucks and how they kind of match up with some of those other teams across the league. And I'm so glad to take a step back and really get into my wheelhouse and talk more about the nitty gritty of like Marjan Beauchamp and second round picks. It's beautiful. Well, it's a great point that you bring that up. We did just finish that podcast, so the Game Theory podcast as well. Make sure you check it out. You should check it out all the time, but uh, I'm going to be on this episode. So if you find yourself thinking, well, what should I do for 90 minutes? I want to hear about these NBA tiers. I want to hear about all these teams that are contending for the title. Go check out that podcast as well. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. And Sam, you know how it works. We thank everyone for making Locked On Bucks your first listen or first watch of every day. Uh, on YouTube, this is the fun stuff. I keep on saying it, but people get involved. We just did this with you, Sam. People are in the comments. They're getting in little debates with themselves and little arguments, and that's what you love to see. Because ultimately... The viewers and listeners are telling us what they want to hear on a daily basis on Locked on Bucks. So we appreciate it. Subscribe, comment, drop a like, all that kind of stuff. It really helps us. Marjan Beauchamp, speaking of helping, is, is a guy that I think the Bucks fans have been intrigued by how he can help this team moving forward. And, and as I said, I think there's a couple of reasons for this. I think the first reason is the Bucks haven't had a lot of young guys to really get behind and fans love nothing more than getting excited about a rookie. Secondly, he's athletic. The Bucks, of course, they've got Giannis, but more broadly, they're kind of a, a ground-based team, I would say, for the most part. So there's a few reasons why fans are excited about Marjan Bochamp. And the other thing I should say, just a really, really likable personality. Yeah. Yes, yes. But if we wind this back to the pre-draft stuff, uh, you've got this draft guide, and this is why I use the word maniac, because this draft guide <laughs> is absolutely insane, and I use it as a resource very, very regularly. But Marjan Bochamp, where were you at with him prior to the draft? So, yeah, I, I ranked Marjan 28th on my board. I liked Marjan. I love the length, the athleticism, also the motor. And before we get to the stuff on the court, I love the story as much as anything. I think that his journey to being a first-round pick – is one of the coolest that we've seen over the course of the last little while in the NBA draft. So he's a great high school player. He goes to train at this facility called Chameleon BX before <laughs> Overtime Elite, before the G League Ignite. And he basically gets stuck with COVID shutting things down where there aren't gyms in the Barry area where he can go and work out, right? And instead of having nowhere to play he just goes back home to washington the state of washington and plays at yakima valley community college and drops like 30 points and 10 rebounds and five assists and he's just like very clearly the best player in that league right the ignite he goes and does like a workout with the ignite basically and just balls out like he, he is someone that they decide immediately that they want to take and he's not the most you know thrilling guy that everyone is excited to see on that team they wanted to see Jaden Hardy. They wanted to see Dyson Daniels. Marjan just kind of sneaks up throughout the year and clearly emerges as a guy that's a first round pick. And I think it goes to show just his perseverance and just the kind of mentality he has about everything that he does. And you see it on the court. He just plays hard, man. He plays with desperation. He plays with that 
I know what it's like to be stuck without basketball. I know what it's like to be playing at Yakima Valley Community College because basketball was briefly taken away from me. So I'm going to go out there and I'm going to give it every single thing that I can. And that's that's what there is to like about him. He tries to defend at a really high level and generally does a pretty good job. Uh you know, great frame at six foot seven with a six foot 11 wingspan. He's going to crash the offensive and defensive glass at a really high level. To me, it's just all about the skill level. And maybe we can talk about that, but we'll see where the skill level allows him to reach in terms of where his NBA ceiling is. Yeah. And I think, and we had uh, a couple of assistant coaches on this show just after the draft. And that was everything that they said. And you learn about the personality and the work ethic. And ultimately, once you get to the NBA, it's harsh, but it can only carry you so far, right? <laughs> so in terms of the the timeline of when you thought this guy, and it changes depending on where you get drafted, of course, but he ends up going 24 to the Bucks, And in many ways, there, there are benefits to getting drafted to a contender, but the obvious negative is that maybe the leash is going to be shorter. There's not going to be as many opportunities to play those big minutes. So far, he's played 560 minutes. The Bucks have had a lot of injuries. Uh, but did you think it was a, is a good situation for him for, for the, the last few years that he's had? Or is he someone that just desperately needs to play um, and maybe would, would benefit from, from going down and playing some G League now that the Bucks are relatively healthy, deep, and he's not going to get a lot of burn? Yeah, so just quickly, you say, like, in terms of how harsh the NBA is, like, I think that him having that proven track record of being able to, like, scale – the wall, right? You're going to hit the rookie wall at some point. You're going to hit a sophomore slump at some, some point being able to scale that and being able to get past it mentally and physically, I think is really important. He's shown that he's going to be able to fight through those tough moments of adversity, right? You're going to get hit with it because every young player in the NBA gets hit with it. Unless you're LeBron James, Zion, whoever, (laughs) right? Even Giannis went through it. Right. So, I really like that aspect of it in terms of what I think would be best for him. I think it was best for him to go to a contender. He's a bit of an older player because of that track record. And I think ultimately his best role is going to be as a role player on a good team. If it ends up working out. So going to a team like Milwaukee that has a specified role for him that he is going to be asked to play I think is really, really beneficial. And I think they're going to be able to work his skill set to fit within that mold perfectly. Do I think it'd be beneficial for him to get more playing time with the G League? Yeah, probably at this point, given that they're healthier, given that they just acquired Jay Crowder, given that Chris Middleton's coming back. And, you know, I know that they just lost Jordan War, obviously. And uh, you could think that some minutes could end up, you know, opening up there. And I haven't really liked, you know, Wes Matthews at all this year in terms of his minutes. So it's not impossible that there could be some minutes for Marjan, but sending him down, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. Just give him an opportunity to go out and get some run. I'm never opposed to that. I don't think. So I want to ask you about then um, potentially, and this is always just a a fun game to play, but, but what do you see Marjan as an NBA player projecting forward? Because again, I don't think it's about this year for Marjan. The other question I have for you is regarding the trade deadline. And look, there was some reports and suggestions and you talked to people that the Bucs were at least exploring the idea of trying to make a more substantial move than Jay Crowder. You put it all together. The Bucs don't have a lot of assets. Maybe Bochamp was a part of that. So I want to ask you about the trade deadline and how the Bucs navigated that. But first, I've got to run through our friends over at FanDuel and we're well beyond the midway point of the NBA season. But now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because new customers get a no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel uh, FanDuel sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scorers to threes drained. So the NBA MVP. I've got the odds in front of me right here. Jokic and Giannis were a lot closer a week ago than they are right now, and we understand why. The wrist injury has come into play. Jokic now, clear favorite, Sam, minus 240. Joel Embiid, the second favorite, at plus 600, and then you have to go down to Giannis at plus 700. Now, Giannis is superhuman, Sam. We don't know how long he's going to be out for, (laughs) but if he comes back, is there any value there at plus 700? I think so. 
uh, if he can get back, you'd have to be continually tracking his injury recovery, I think, to place a bet on this, right? Like, I think you would need to know he's tracking well, he's not tracking well. And I think you should wait to do so because mm-hmm. of that. But man, how good was he right before the All-Star break? How good was he? I mean, he had closed that gap in such a substantial way. I had, I, look, I think Jokic is probably going to win. If I'm being completely honest, I think Jokic is probably going to win. But plus 600, if he can get back in the next seven games, something like that, and keep playing the way that he was playing prior to the All-Star break, yeah, why not? I, I don't think it's a bad bet. It's just tantalizing there for Bucks fans. But FanDuel even lets you combine your bets as well for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss the chances, uh, your chance to get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. Uh, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on. And you can find out more, make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, long term, we love the projection game. Uh, based on what you knew about Marjon heading into the draft. And as we said, yeah. maybe he's more challenging to project the development because of the path he went through. You can certainly uh, tell me more about that. But but where do you see him? And look, we always reference the chart from our friend Seth Part now, a colleague, a colleague of yours, and about the, the, the probabilities of the different draft picks panning out to be rotation players yeah. and all-stars and all that. And the reality is when you get to pick 24, Chances are dramatically dropped. So you have to temper your expectations. But what what do you actually project for Bochamp with the skill set from what you've seen thus far? Look, he's the kind of guy where if it hits, he is going to be very valuable as a role player. But I think that it's... I don't want to say that the likelihood is low that he's going to hit, but I think that there are real flaws in, in terms of his game that could really come back and cause him issues. So the shooting is the big one, right? He's currently making 32.2% of his three pointers. If you dig into those numbers a little bit more on catch and shoot jumpers this season, he is at catch and shoot threes this season. He's at 32.6% according to synergy, but purely on spot up three pointers this season, he's at 37.5. It's that everything else that he's taken outside of a spot up three has been bad in terms of his catch and shoot stuff. The most important thing that he can do though, is catch and shoot from three in spot up situations. So am I encouraged? Am I discouraged by this? I think he's just not a great shooter at this point. I think that his misses are very inconsistent. And this is something that you could go back and see in terms of like his draft profile as well. Uh, it's just, it's a very loud shot, you know, like uh, anytime he has to rush to get it off, anytime that closeout comes a little bit quicker, it just feels like it gets real variant. It gets real variable in terms of where it's going to go. I think if he shoots it, he's a very useful player, but what do I think the odds are that he's going to shoot it below 50%, let's say at least. Uh, and if he doesn't shoot it, it becomes hard to put him on the court in playoff games which is Bucks fans. I think that's the most important thing moving forward. Yeah, it's fascinating that you, you say that because we've spoke about it before on this. And first of all, you love the confidence he's come in when he's got his minutes, totally. he's willing to shoot. And yeah, he's been streaky, which is fine. He'll have his nights where he goes four for five from three and you're like, wow, that looks great. But we've also seen the games where he'll airball a corner three yeah. and, and miss by a long way. And then a couple of minutes later, he'll hit it. It looks perfect. And you're like, gee, there is a lot of variance in that shot and the result you get. So the question I have then with these guys that are in this range where you go, and you can say this for a lot of guys, but with Bochamp, I think he fits in the category where you're like, yeah, I could see him being a rotation player and because of the the size and the versatility, he can be a playoff defensive player, which is what every team is looking for from that size. But also maybe he just doesn't work out, which means that you've only got a very small window to cash in on potentially moving a guy that shows some stuff And teams are quick to catch on to this. So that comes back to the trade deadline. You hear stuff, you're plugged in, you know. And and look, there was talk about Fred Van Fleet. That was was one big name that perhaps the Bucs were were kicking the tires on. 
And as we went through the packages and what the Bucks have, you've got a 2029 first rounder. That's really it. There's some mullet. There's one pick swap you can do, I think, 2027. But they just don't have a lot else. So who are the other young guys outside of your key guys that you don't want to move? Well, Bochamp was the guy. That is like he's a fresh first rounder. Haven't seen a lot of him. He's got potential. Were you, would you have been surprised if the Bucks made a move there? And, and how challenging is that for a contending team that doesn't really want to waste time and wants to get the, yeah. get the job done right now in making a decision about those prospects that are on the fence between being a, a rotation guy and maybe not? I think it's a very difficult balancing act for sure. In terms of how I would have approached it, I would have been completely open to moving him but it would have needed to be someone that I think could have been like a legit somewhat like useful difference maker for them. Right. Like just go through who could have been available at the deadline. Right. If Boyan Bogdanovich was available, I would send Marjan packing in a heartbeat because that's just mm-hmm. like a perfect fit in terms of shooting and spacing. And this team desperately needs offense it is offensive creation on some level outside of Giannis, uh, just given where Middleton seems to be at this point, you know, like could Gary Trent have been an option? Would I have moved Marjan Beauchamp for a guy that is about to get very expensive this off season when he signs another contract worth 16 million for this particular team where that probably becomes a rental. I probably would not have moved Marjan Beauchamp for a rental. I would have wanted someone that could have been around for a couple more years that I think I could have gotten on a somewhat reasonable deal. Uh, Jalen McDaniels is a guy that could have been interesting for them, but he doesn't have any playoff track record. Uh, Josh Richardson just isn't a guy that I think should cost Mm -hmm. a first round pick. Uh, Eric Gordon isn't a guy that should cost a first round pick. Jay Crowder did not cost a first round pick, right? So ultimately I would have involved Marjan Beauchamp in conversations where I could have gotten a genuine difference maker who would have entered my starting lineup. Guys like Kyle Kuzma, if he would have been available, guys like, you know, Bogdanovich or, you know, OG Ananobi, but they don't really have enough for OG Ananobi. But even someone like, even someone like Sadiq Bey, I know that was like a name that I heard kind of get kicked around. I, not in terms of like front offices, but publicly, I heard like, you know, Bucks fans looking at like Sadiq Bay is one or two, you know, one and a half more years left on his deal where he's relatively cheap. I wouldn't have moved Beauchamp for Bay because I don't know if he can actually play in the playoffs. Uh, mm-hmm. He's a little bit slow defensively. The shot is very inconsistent. Yeah, he can create a little bit offensively, but I, I would have just rather held on to the Beauchamp ticket and taken a guy that I know can defend in that you can just teach to shoot at some point, hopefully if it goes right. So I I think that might kind of give you a feel of where I was on this. Just I would have been in if it involved a starting caliber player that could have immediately made a difference for me. I would have been open to discussing him in that way. But anything less than that, I would have probably just been like, I'll just take Jay Crowder for five second round picks and move on. Yeah, and I think that is the absolute reasonable way to look at it because ultimately – if you don't, if you're trading in for someone that isn't a guaranteed thing, or there is just exponential cost on the luxury tax that you're going to make you to make fur is going to cause you to make further moves down the line. You, know, you take the risk. It's a pick twenty four in the end. It's not like this is a, this is a guy that you used the top five draft pick on, and you need to cash in on the value because you're worried that it, it wasn't uh, the right move. So I totally agree yeah. with you. But this is the perfect segue because you spoke about Jay Crowder <laughs> and the five second round picks. So after this. I want to ask you about the value of draft picks because it's gone absolutely crazy. All right, Sam. So you mentioned the Jay Crowder trade, five second round draft picks. Now, I know for a fact that you did... uh, Well, I don't know this for a fact, but I am making an assumption that you didn't get a a wink of sleep before trade deadline over here in Australia. But but I did. I set my alarm for 4 a.m. And I believe the Jay Crowder trade went down at around that time. So I went to sleep at about midnight, 1 a.m. the night before, get a couple of hours sleep, wake up, see what's going on three hours before the deadline. And we had the conversation about, you know, what do, what do, why do we care about second round draft picks? Like, yeah. How many second round draft picks would you give up for Jay Crowder? And yet when I woke up and I saw five, I was like, five second round draft picks for Jay Crowder? What is going on here? And then what we saw over the next few hours is 
everyone was giving up unlimited second round draft picks. How did you assess the value of draft picks? And we've seen it with firsts as well, we should say, in recent years. What has gone on with these teams and how they value these picks? Well, in Milwaukee's case, too, they like, didn't they move? Like, they got a couple of seconds from Indiana, mm-hmm. right? And then, like, they moved those for Jay Crowder. And what mm-hmm. ended up being like minus two or three second yeah. rounders for Milwaukee, like in aggregate, right? And I think you have to consider it in, ag- in aggregate at the end of the day, because all of these teams are doing things at the deadline from a big picture perspective as opposed to a small picture perspective. In terms of second rounders, so I actually, Stunner. I, I did a little bit of reporting, did a little bit of asking <laughs> around, did a little bit of uh, tr- trying to figure this out, right? So I talked to front office folks across the league, and basically, A, the cost of doing business is just like very high right now for the high end difference makers, right? So guys like OG and Anobi would have cost four first round picks, something <laughs> like that, right? And because that price is so high, Teams are trying to maintain as much trade flexibility as anything. So it's not that they're like valuing first round picks more. It's that they're valuing like the ability to trade those first round picks more. And with the Stepien rule, you can only move basically four of your own first round picks at once. If you have other picks, it gets a little bit more complicated. Obviously you can move, uh, you know, five or six in a deal. If you really need to, if you have a cache of picks like Oklahoma city or Utah Mm -hmm. does, but if you are stuck with what you've got, you want to maintain that flexibility. And I think teams are very intrigued by maintaining that flexibility, which is why they have become much more inclined to be willing to give up the extra second round picks that it would require because those rules, there is no step in rule for giving up unlimited second round picks or giving up a certain number of those picks or maintaining flexibility. You can move as many second round picks as you want if you've got them. So because of that, I think that teams are trying to maintain first round flexibility to be able to go out and get real difference makers, which leads to these trades for sixth men, seventh men, maybe fifth starters, although Josh Hart did end up getting a first Mm. round pick. Uh, Sixth men, seventh men, eighth men off the bench. I think that it leads to those guys getting an abundance of second rounders as opposed to the past where, you know, maybe a good rotation player might get a late first round pick. But if you can maintain that flexibility long term, it allows you to stay in the game longer for true difference makers. So we've discussed this and and my thoughts are, I mean, like... (laughs) Again, you come back to the percentage chance of pick 47 becoming a starting caliber. Pl- I mean, it, the percentage chances right. are low. And yes, there's been the rare stuff and the Bucs saw it with Malcolm Brogdon. Everyone goes to Jokic, all this kind of stuff. Like there is those needle in the haystack type of thing. But to me, I just look back and say, well, why should I care about giving away these these second round draft picks that a lot of them or uh, multiple of them, the Bucks owned. So you think as long as you got Giannis, they're going to be you know, crappy picks anyway. So what do you say to, or what's your thoughts if a fan says, this is ridiculous. Why are they giving away these five-round picks? Well, like, Why should a fan care about second-round picks in these types of moves? So I can give you the math on this. So the Bucks are obviously a contending team. They figure to be a contending team for the next five years, let's say. Hopefully longer, but for as long as Giannis is there, as long as Giannis is in his prime, they should expect to be somewhere in the bottom 10 of the second round. Fair, right? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Over the last nine <laughs> NBA drafts. I already love it. So that's 90 players selected in those final 10 selections. Maybe 89. I can't remember. There might have been one where uh, picks were forfeited, right? But of those 90 players that were selected in the final 10 selections from the 2012 draft to the 2020 draft, do you know how many of them became rotation players? Uh, I think it has to be less than 10. I'd say like seven, six. You can get it on one hand. It's five. Yeah. So yeah, you yeah. have a five in 90 chance, basically, which is a five to 7% chance, five to 6% chance of getting someone who can be a difference maker. Once you get into that bottom 10 of the second round. So 
to say these picks are worthless if you're giving up Bucks picks that figure to transfer uh, at some point in the next five years, they, they're kind of worthless. They're, they're barring a Giannis injury, barring Chris Middleton completely falling off of a cliff, barring Drew Holiday, you know, God forbid, knock on wood, like tearing every ligament in his knee. They're going to be in that bottom 10 range, right? And these picks are just not valuable. So as long as they're giving up their own picks, it's just it's it's not it's not a big deal. Well, the data is just a tough blow for those that are still <laughs> still firmly riding the Hugo Besson train, who is uh, over there in France right now. And uh, tough break, tough break for those guys, Sam. Five for ninety, Hugo Besson's shooting percentage or the amount of <laughs> second round picks that hit uh, every year. Come in on, a single man. game, because Hugo will get them up, man. <laughs> That's right. That is exactly right. Come on, we got to show some respect to our New Zealand former New Zealand breaker. Great. Well, played one season actually. Uh, I don't think we can say that. But uh, Hugo Besson, you know, he's playing over there with Vic. I actually haven't checked the stats, but I'm sure he's getting oh, some some shots up. Can confirm he's getting more than some. <laughs> you telling me you're watching that team? You watching that team for Hugo, obviously, or is there another yeah, guy? You know, it's... Watching, watching for Hugo, not the big seven foot five guy that's going to be the first round or first overall pick in the 2023 draft. Definitely not him. He, look, Hugo's going to be like a really good Euro player. He'll be like a really good scorer in Euro League for a lot of years. Uh, I don't think he's an NBA player, but he's fun. He is fun. Uh, this has been fun as well, Sam, and we've podcasted for over two hours today. So let's uh, let's call it quits for at least today. We'll see how we feel Just today. We'll see how we feel tomorrow. Uh, I, I plugged obviously some of the stuff, but you'll do it better than me. Tell everyone where they should be reading all your draft stuff and uh, wider NBA content. Yeah, go to the Game Theory Podcast on whatever podcasting platform you use. We're on YouTube, Game Theory Podcast with Sam Vecini. And then go to The Athletic. You'll be able to find all of my written work there. Uh, You'll also be able to find Eric Name, who does a tremendous job, uh, who both of us are friends with. Kane, obviously, a little bit more than me. So go go read for Eric's work. Don't go read for my work. (laughs) Don't be humble. There's no room for that. So do it for both of those uh, fine gentlemen over there at The Athletic. Make sure you also check out the Locked On Game to Game podcast where you get the recaps from uh, across the the previous night's NBA action, which is exciting because, let's face it, I've been getting through the middle of the days over here in Australia and wondering what the hell am I going to do with myself. The NBA is back tomorrow. The Bucks will play the Heat, which means we've got one more podcast on a non-game day before the Bucks get back into action on the weekend. So we'll podcast tomorrow. And then uh, we might be overly excited and do a weekend post-game podcast, but we'll see. But make sure you subscribe to Locked On Bucks so you'll know when we do. Hit the notifications, drop a comment, a like, and all that stuff. And especially for today's podcast, uh, jump on the YouTube comments and let us know your thoughts on Marjan Bochamp and what you see in the future. We'd like to hear uh, what Bucks fans are thinking. Uh, Sam's a star. We'll have him back on, I have no doubt, at some point uh, in the near future. Until tomorrow, we'll speak.